when we're discussing agricultural productivity, when we're discussing the food that we're eating, more and more sustainability is literally becoming a bigger and bigger component of the conversation in this case. And so I think it's an it's a interesting way to dovetail into the conversation that we're going to have with our very esteemed panelists here as we talk about how do we not only feed the growing population, but also how do we do it sustainably. And so uh, to do that, we have, a, we have a number of distinguished panelists, and first up is a uh, biotechnology expert from the University of California at Davis, uh, Allison Van, Van Enenem. Her work in animal biotechnology and genomics has earned her numerous recognitions, including the 2009 Academic Federation Award for Excellence in Research and the American Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities National Award for Excellence in Extension. She's a sought-after speaker for her insights on biotechnology applications in the field of animal science. Ladies and gentlemen, Allison Van Enenem. You may notice in your program, uh, we were to be joined by Bill Even, the CEO of the National Pork Board. Uh, he was also blit by the blizzard bug in Des Moines, but he sends his regrets and he also sends us Craig Morris, the Vice President of International Marketing for the National Pork Board. Uh, prior to joining the board last fall, Craig served as the Deputy Administrator for Livestock, Poultry, and Seed Programs for USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service for many years. Ladies and gentlemen, Craig Morris. We're also joined today by Anita Federoff of OFW Law. Federoff is a molecular biologist known for her research in life sciences and biotechnology. She's a 2007 recipient of the National Medal of Science and is a member of the United States National Academy of Science. Federoff is a trusted voice on science and technology policy as she has served as a science and tech advisor to the U.S. Secretaries of State, Nina Federoff. Also joining us today, uh, the other Sonny at the Department of Agriculture, Sonny Ramaswamy, the director of USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Before his NIFA appointment, he held academic and research positions with several land-grant institutions, including Oregon State, Purdue, Kansas State, and Mississippi State. His background as a scientist helps inform his role at NIFA, the branch that you, of USDA that provides leadership and funding for research programs that advance agricultural-related sciences. Sonny Ramaswamy. And last but certainly not least, on the far uh, left, your far right, uh, Jim Borrell, the advisor for food company Hampton Creek. Jim has over 40 years of experience in the global agriculture and food sectors, having served as the executive vice president at DuPont and also a member of DuPont's office of the chief executive. Borrell also advises several food and agriculture companies, including Farmer's Edge, Neogen Corporation, and Just Incorporated. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Borrell. Now, in, in the conversation around production and sustainability, there's always two numbers that come up, uh, 9 billion and 2050 in some order uh, thereof. We've also seen that 9 billion number has increased a little bit. So as I work to uh, work my way over to the uh, patented conference leather chairs, I also want to, Jim, I'll have you start off with us. Are we on track, do you think, to feed that 9, potentially 10 billion people by 2050 and do it sustainably? I think we are. Uh, maybe I'll start with the bottom line, but, but I think we need to think about it in, uh, a little more broadly. So first of all, from seven to nine or 10 billion means we're gonna have to produce more, but a lot of people don't remember that we're actually producing over 2,500 calories per man, woman, and child around the world today. So the problem today is not really a production problem. It's, I'll say distribution, it's the affordability and the accessibility of having the food where and when it's needed. And of course, we've got well over a third of it is, is lost between harvest and consumption. And, and, um, and so we, ha we have plenty of issues that, that when I think about going forward, we need to improve production, increase production, but we also have opportunities to improve quality, accessibility, and, uh, and, and uh, storage. Mm -hmm. Craig, your thoughts? I agree. I, I think without question, we right now leave a lot of calories on the table, as you put it, but I, I think we are going to have to increase our productivity in the years ahead uh, to feed the growing population. I think the challenge we're going to have isn't is the science capable of getting us there. It's if we can produce that product in a way that to today's and tomorrow's consumers will accept. I think social responsibility, sustainability, uh, those aren't just buzzwords for the millennial generation. I think those are, are really words that they live by. And so I I think what's important for us in agriculture is to make sure that, that we convey that message accurately. Uh, we convey that message in a way that, that 
uh, really provides for that product to, to find a market. Mm -hmm. Now we, we talk a lot about the, the science, but the, with, with the science also comes the regulatory certainty that a lot of people are pursuing. And, uh, and, and Allison, you, you worked on an on a op-ed with, uh, with Nina uh, at the Des Moines Register that was run on the subject of how do we get the regulation right that allows the technology to proceed. So I'll ask you that same question. How do we get the regulation right that allows for the, the uh, amount of improvements that we're going to need in agriculture to proceed? Right, well, for those of you that don't know me, I'm an animal breeder and, and Nina's a plant breeder, so we're kind of the yin and the yang here. Um, and I think that uh, what we were expressing was the need for the regulations to be risk and product based rather than triggered by the breeding method that was used to produce the product. Um, and I think this is not a new thing. The scientists have been screaming this for 20 years. It's not how they've played Th out. 30 years. 30 years, all right. Um, and I think that's really forestalled the use of these innovations, especially in animal breeding. I mean, you've got 18 million farmers growing GMO crops and not a single approved product that you can commercially buy in the United States as it relates to food animals, as it relates to genetic engineering. So that's partly due to some of these regulatory uh, triggers. And um, I think what we were arguing for is to have it be risk-based because that's the product based, that's where um, regulation should function, not based on technology. And, and Alison, you mentioned the, the, the improvements that could be made there, with, specifically with the animal side. From your perspective as, as the scientist, how far off are some of those improvements? If regulation gets out of the way, how far off realistically are some of those improvements? Um, well, I mean, there's plenty. We talked about sitting on the shelf. There's been multiple genetically engineered animals produced over the years. For example, a mastitis-resistant cow by the USDA, 2006. Um, we've had um, disease-resistant applications that are sitting on the shelf. I think the discussion we were having is perhaps also associated with these newer breeding methods, the genetic uh, editing or genome editing, um, and there's already been applications like disease-resistant pigs, there's the PERS-resistant pigs, porcine reproductive respiratory syndrome virus pigs, that is just basically tweaking a gene off where the virus gains entry to the pig and if those pigs are no longer susceptible to that disease. That's been produced by the University of Missouri and Genus is currently interested in taking that to market. So I think we're actually there um, if we can get the regulations right and, and focused on the risk associated, if there is, novel risks associated with the product. And, and Nina, we, we talk about the, the issues all over the world with this. I, will, I guess my, my question is, is there any one place that does it right? And if not, who's closest? Probably Canada is closest because they are explicitly um, product-based and not, or trait-based and not um, process-based. We are nominally product-based, but in fact, over the past 30 years, with one small exception so far, uh, any uh, animal or uh, plant modified by molecular techniques has been regulated as if it were potentially risky. Well, we've now accumulated, depending on how you count it, half a century, but arguably in production, uh, 20 years of commercially produced uh, crops enhanced by molecular methods. And um, that's been, there have been uh, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of safety studies done. There is no evidence that using those methods is in itself harmful. That is not the same as saying that any biotech product is inherently safe, but what it says is that we don't have to worry about it because it was modified by molecular techniques. What's left, what the trait is, what the characteristic is, what the characteristics of the product. So today, the task before regulators is not to modernize, it's to go back to the first principles and regulate the product. Sit down, make a list of the traits that you can imagine, or from empirical data, there is evidence could be harmful to human health, animal health, the environment, whatever, and then confine regulation to those traits. Now, now is the time to do it because 
we have a huge interest in using the new CRISPR-Cas technology to modify all kinds of traits. This presents a very difficult challenge to the regulatory system if it's left alone as it is in, in practice product process-based. The reason is that the end result of the genetic modification can be indistinguishable from the end result of all the genetic modifications that underlie domestication as well as underlie agriculture in the 20th century when we used radiation and chemical mutagenesis. Therefore, this is the time to get the regulations right and make it truly product-based, not process-based. So if now is the time, what is the avenue? Do we need to do this through a trade agreement? Do we need to pursue legislation in each of these individual countries? Do we need to pursue administrative action? And I'll, I'll leave that open for, for anyone on the panel that feels like jumping on it, but if now is the time, what is the proper method? This, that's confusing two issues. We have to get our regulatory stance right uh, and then negotiate with the rest of the world. I, I don't think we can do it, but through international agreements, I think that would complicate it tremendously. Okay. If I may, yeah, just this morning, I don't know if the others have seen it, I saw a headline coming across saying that the Europeans are not going to be regulating gene edited uh, products. And well, I, I just saw it this little, morning. Yeah, but I think that's a little too broad. But that's the way it, the, yeah, the headline read, the headline. and I, I'm going to look for the article tonight right. and, and read it as well. But the point of the matter is, I, mean, I think, uh, to Nina's uh, point, is that we got to get our act together and then you know, harmonize globally as well. And I think that's a critically important step to take, is that as these various uh, uh, trade agreements are coming about, is to also harmonize uh, this issue pertaining to uh, biotechnology itself. But regardless of the trade agreements, if other markets are bringing these technologies to production faster than us, that still produces product in the world market which affects U.S. producers. And so I think that shows even the, the greater urgency that we get our regulatory environment in, in better position than it is currently so that we're not only capable of taking advantage of these technologies, but so that U.S. producers aren't held at a disadvantage in really what is more of a global market. I mean, for U.S. pork, for example, you know, 26.6 U.S. pork is exported. We depend on those markets for U.S. producer returns. Even if we don't have access to certain markets, pork globally hurts demand for U.S. pork. Mm -hmm. Does the current administration offer a better chance or a worse chance or a same chance as that we've always had to get our, our acts together, as some of you have said, to get our acts together on some of these regulations? Yeah. I think it has the best chance, given I, I, I'm not subscribing to the entire anti-regulatory uh, mindset. Nonetheless, I think in this particular case, we've been regulating hypothetical hazards for 30 years. And if this administration can't get it right, we may not have another chance. Because remember, politicians are also subject, for the most part, to what the public thinks. And that creates a certain barrier to getting uh, the, the um, scientific, getting regulations up to date with the scientific consensus, okay? So you can't get too far from what the public at large thinks, but right now I think is the time. And I think one, one other very critical issue is to get all of the regulations that have to do with agricultural plants, animals, and other organisms, like microorganisms, um, under one roof, logically the USDA. Mm -hmm. And, and just to add to that, for those of you that aren't in this area, um, currently gene edited animals are mandatorily regulated by the FDA and, and they've proposed to regulate all intentional alterations, be they a SNP based pair change or, or a gene deletion, as new animal drugs. Um, and that's very different to the USDA's approach um, on gene edited plants and it just, it's kind of um, strange to have diff different kingdoms being regulated in almost 180 degrees apart from each other in terms of it and so is it product risk that we're, we're regulating or is it human intention and I, I think that human intention trigger seems to me to be much more almost ideological than risk based. Mm -hmm. And Jim, if, if all of our wishes come true, we get the regulatory structure just how we want it, uh, scientists are churning out new technologies like crazy, will consumers buy them? Not automatically, but hopefully. Uh, one, one thing I think we, always, we often take for granted is that um, we need a good regulatory system, appropriate regulatory system, to build, comp 
to build some confidence. And we have plenty of uh, evidence over the last decades of, particularly in the U.S., uh, already happened in other parts of the world, of, of, of declining consumer confidence in the regulatory agencies. So if we can get our act together, it's good for the, for the use of the technologies, but it's also good for kind of starting a process of building consumer confidence that they can actually hopefully trust that, that uh, folks are looking out for their, uh, for their well-being. Um, second thing is, of course, industry's got to figure out how to, to um, talk about and behave. You can't, you can't talk your way out of a problem you behave your way into. But so both of those, uh, uh, you know, responsible use and, and sustainable use, et cetera, but also making sure that the messaging is, uh, is right. There will be plenty of people who are either anti-technology or anti-company or anti-science in general um, that will try to find ways to poke holes. And the, the folks who are investing in the technology have to find ways to be consistent and clear and responsible and proactive. Um, and we have to do a better job this time around than we did uh, you know, uh, 30 or 40 years ago when we were introducing the last round of major technology. And uh, another question, just kind of shifting things back toward the farm level looking at the, the way that things already are. And we talk about these new technologies, but it really just kind of undergirds the point that consumer perception is what it is, and it's going to be very a very difficult thing to change. But looking at that, is American agriculture as it sits right now sustainable enough, or do we need to make, do are these technologies necessary to make the measured improvements in order to maybe change that consumer perception? I mean, I'll, I'll speak from a marketing perspective. From a pork board uh, uh, perspective, our, our goal is to maintain producer profitability, keep the United States competitive in world markets. We enjoy a very low cost of production in the United States, and that's one of the reasons that we are so competitive internationally. And I think one of the concerns that we would have is that that competitive advantage that we have today would be then lost. I mean, we have 82% uh, you know, of the variety meats that come off of U.S. hogs are exported. If tomorrow we are a less efficient country, those very price sensitive products become less competitive in the foreign markets that we depend on for U.S. producer returns. We have to be at the forefront of every technological advance to maintain that competitive advantage that we have. Yeah, if I might add to that, uh, I mean, if you look at all the innovations that are coming along, you know, in the pipeline, uh, whether it's in the government labs or academic labs or even the private sector labs and things like that, it really is about. Uh, you know, enhancing productivity with a significantly smaller ecological footprint so that there's a lot less water used, a lot less land used, a lot less fertilizer used, et cetera. And I think ultimately, you know, going back to the question that you, the way you framed it about the sustainability aspects of it, that's going to help promote that aspect of it. But ultimately, I think any innovation that is developed and deployed and thinking of the regulations and all that has to take in mind Profitability. If we don't worry about profitability, I'm looking at farm incomes today that are so badly depressed. If we don't worry about it, all the innovations of the world means no, mean nothing at all. It's worthless. So really, those things need to be tied. Sustainability to what end has to be thought of. Productivity to what end has to be thought of. And that end is really the profitability of our, of our farming systems. And just to add to that, I think Sonny's right on around productivity, productivity being core to sustainability. And I think you know, there probably are as many definitions of sustainability as there are people in the room. Um, but if you think about it in those terms, if you can figure out ways to get more output per unit of input, it means your footprint's going to go down. It means that you're going to produce more and better quality products. And oh, by the way, generally, better productivity means better profitability as well. And it becomes a virtuous cycle rather than um, uh, arbitrary regulation that forces some kind of an outcome that almost gets in the way of strong continuous improvement. So if we can get the ag and food system from producers through to, to ultimately to the consumer thinking about it that way and working on it, there are all sorts of tools that are going to help us continue to improve sustainability. We've made great improvements over the, the, the last couple of decades, uh, but if you ask me are we sustainable enough, no. But we're probably never going to be, uh, we should never say, hey, we've declared victory. We don't have to work on this anymore. It's a, it's a continuous uh, improvement view in my, uh, in my view.
The thing I'd add, I, I think consistently in the consumer polls, one of the concerns that we see as agriculture is, is we take pride in feeding the world. We take pride in efficiency. Unfortunately, with consumers, that doesn't often pull well. They see uh, doing more with less as cutting corners and things that don't necessarily mean you're producing as good of a product. And I think that's why a lot of the technologies that are in the pipeline today related to eliminating diseases in animals, uh, producing a more nutritious product, those are the things that we need to put at the front of the line really to help consumers understand that these technologies can do good things in addition to keeping agriculture as competitive as it is today. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think there's been this, uh, that there's some sort of a mutual exclusivity in terms of improving input traits and then output traits. Mm -hmm. And I think both of them are really important, particularly the output traits. You know, the healthfulness of the foods that we consume and those sorts of things are as important as on the input side itself. But I'd like to address the issue of public opinion. Here are all the things that we should be uh, telling consumers about, and there isn't a voice that is trusted as much as the USDA voice is on issues of agriculture, but they're not doing a good job of letting the public know. Now, coming back to public opinion, it's a really tough nut to crack because it's not about delivering lots and lots of facts. People generally today, because of the activities of certain industries, such as the um, organic food industry, have come to believe that GM anything that has to do with food is bad. They don't know, there's a wonderful segment from a Jimmy Kimmel show that I tend to use in yeah. lectures that interviewing people at, at a farmer's market. And basically the bottom line is they know it's bad, they don't know what it is, okay? <laughs> so you're addressing a belief system, you're not addressing a, a, a dearth of facts, even though the dearth of facts also exists. So getting information out and using all modern techniques. There are, there, there are several very good writers that are science-based that have blogs and, and are constantly on Twitter. Getting that information out from a more reliable source uh, a more recognized source, such as USDA, is really critically important. But changing beliefs is still tough, and we don't know anything about it. In fact, um, NIFA has just given um, a, a sociologist and physicist um, colleague and me a grant to study exactly that process of uh, belief change. Now. Everybody that's been in this business knows that if you have the time to build trust with someone, you can change a mind. That's different from changing a perception across many, many minds. We don't know whether it can be done, but at least we're beginning to study it. So we know a lot from psychologists about how we form beliefs. We don't know very much about how beliefs change. Mm -hmm. You raise, I think, two really important points in that, and that although I'll admit that public trust in regulatory institutions has declined, it still always pulls unbelievably high, USDA, FDA. So whatever the regulatory environment is, be it an FDA or a USDA construct, the, the presence of an approval system is going to be viewed by the public oftentimes as a better uh, statement of trust in the technology than the complete absence of a regulatory framework. So I agree, we need a effective, a coherent regulatory framework, be it at USDA or FDA, but the presence of that regulatory framework could potentially go a long way in building consumer trust in these technologies as they come online. If they talk about it. If they talk if about they it. Tell, if, if, if a real mindset occurs in USDA that says we really must be responsible for letting the public know what the what the benefits and the real risks are. Mm -hmm. So some of you may may recognize uh, Allison from her starring role in a, in a recent documentary on uh, on a subject very very similar to this. Uh, that that being food evolution, I'm sure many many of you in the room have seen it. But for those of you that haven't, it kind of takes on this topic in terms of the the messaging of some of this technology, how it's being received, how it could potentially be beneficial. And and Allison, I know you've done some done some traveling to to host panel discussions uh, after that uh, after that documentary has been viewed. I'm wondering if in your in your various travels regarding this documentary. How have you seen the kind of the consumer before and after? How have you seen the conversation shift sort of before and after viewing a documentary like that? 
Um, sure. Well, thanks. So Food Evolution, if you haven't seen it, it's available on Hulu for free. <laughs> um, little plug there. Um, but basically, it looks at the GMO controversy as, as kind of a proxy for more generally how people make decisions and how difficult it is to get people to change their mind once they've made their mind up. And it really probes the misinformation around the safety that's this rampant throughout the world. That's why there's this huge gap here. And it hasn't really told the story of what you could use this, this for. Um, and we particularly focused in the movie on a couple of applications of disease resistance, the papaya in Hawaii and the banana in Uganda, um, and how this breeding method could produce disease resistant plants. Um, and I think that what's been interesting for me is that um, going to, especially um, audiences that, that don't have a dog in the fight, so just normal film festival audiences that might be at, I don't know, Cleveland Film Festival or something. And at the beginning, in a very non-scientific way, have people put up their hands whether they have concerns around GMOs as it relates to their own health or the health of the planet. And typically you'll get a, a, a percentage of the audience will put up their hands. In some cases, like in Seattle, I think Scott said there was 100% of people put their hands up. Um, and at the end, um, a, a much lower proportion did. In some cases, none, but they may felt like they didn't, weren't comfortable doing so. And what's really satisfying for me is that then people have come up to me, just normal consumers without a dog in the fight, and said, I had no idea. Um, this movie really made me think, and I'm going to go and do my own research. And I guess as a science communicator, I can't ask for a better outcome than that. Um, and I think that that narrative storytelling about the shared values that we all have, and I think this term sustainability has been hijacked by marketing groups to suggest that their production system is the one sustainable production system and everybody else is evil. Um, and it's just not that simple. And I think there's nothing more annoying than this dichotomous framing of good, bad, you know, evil, evil savior, um, because agriculture is complicated. And sometimes it might make sense to use um, a GMO disease resistant plant in a system that doesn't use other chemical inputs. Um, and so, you know, I think that this, um, this, this uh, dichotomous framing rather than a yes and discussion is really harming agriculture and this hijacking of sustainability is a real problem because it's precluding access to innovation which in turn is actually making agriculture less um, efficient and less sustainable and, and I think consumers are being lied to and, and convinced that this is a sustainable production system and their buying is not in actual alignment with their values of preserving environment. Um, and that's because the story they're told hasn't discussed the trade-offs associated with foregoing innovation in agricultural production systems. May, may I pick up? Yeah. So I want to get back to what Nina was talking about first. You know, the grant that uh, she and her colleagues have received uh, from my agency, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, is specifically on uh, uh, you know, getting better sense of the social implications of these new technologies coming along. You know, what do they mean? How, why do people make decisions about whether they should accept these things or not? And we're hoping that people like Nina and the others can help us think this through very carefully. Going to what uh, Allison's referring to as well is, I mean, you know, these, these things get hijacked, these terms get hijacked, and they're given a pejorative or a derogatory or a negative uh, uh, meaning and things like that and really proactively we've got to the the scientific community and the agricultural community needs to proactively present uh, these topics in a way and so we're hoping that the kind of work that's being done by Allison and, and Nina and others that we provide funding for are going to allow us to make that forward progression. Last thing is in terms of the, the word trust itself, right? I mean, you know, we trust certain types of people. We trust our neighbors, we trust our own family, et cetera, but we do not trust the outsiders. And, and we, you know, we're becoming uh, hyper-partisan in what we do in America and around the world as well. And I think in many ways, the newer technologies, you know, the internet and other things. Uh, there's, a, there's a guy named Eli Pariser. He calls this, we live in these filter bubbles, you know? And, uh, uh, you know, I'm a conservative and my search you know, it is rendered by Google with only more conservative leaning data. And, and Allison may be a liberal, and in her case, uh, Google will render it as more liberal leaning. So it's the relevancy, you know, her relevancy and my relevancy. And so we're getting further and further apart. I tune into my own channels, I tune into my own. 
TV station or radio station or newspaper or whatever, and we talk about that, right? And, you know, Birkenstock wearing, NPR listening, <laughs> New York Times reading type versus, you know, something else. And I think, you know, we've got to figure out how best to bridge that gap as well. And the trust thing really, you know, we've got something built into America's system, and that is called Cooperative Extension Service. We've got those individuals, used to be in every one of the 3,143 counties and boroughs and parishes in America. We've shrunk that by about a third. But those individuals live in those small communities. They work with those people. They go to the same church. They go, their children go to the same schools. Uh, they play on the same softball team and all that. Trust is very much a part of it. There's some wonderful work done by uh, multiple uh, academic institutions on showing the, the importance of that extension person in that small community that is highly trusted. And we've not utilized that group of individuals to take this all this amazing knowledge and, and convey it to those uh, people that they live with and work with and play with as well. Well, I mean, the only thing I'd add is I think U.S. agriculture, one of our strengths is we've been very data-driven, but I think we've unfortunately left the, the consumers out of that data, and so they don't understand a lot of the things that we intuitively know. I think consumers look at the way their grandparents farmed as the more sustainable, more environmentally sustainable way, and that's just not what the data shows us. I mean, today, in the last 50 years, we're producing some uh, per unit of pork with 78% less uh, land, 41% uh, less water, 35% less carbon. We just need to get that data out so people understand the farming practices of yesteryear are not more environmentally sustainable. A lot of the things that we're doing today, in fact, are. As we continue our conversation, I just want to remind all of you that you can participate in that conversation. Uh, submit questions using Slido. Uh, pull out your phone. Let us know if there's some thoughts that you have for the panel. Uh, we'll be we'll be happy to to engage there. Uh, but uh, be, as, as we as we collect those questions, Jim, I, I want to go back to something that Allison mentioned about the the term sustainability being hijacked, and a number of companies have taken it and used it for their own purposes. So I wonder, is sustainability there for agriculture to get back? Or is there a new concept that needs to be unleashed for American agriculture? I think the concept is there. I think we need to be careful that we don't fall into the trap of still using the word and then arguing about the definition. Let, uh, I mentioned behavior before. If we continue to do the things that really improve sustainability, and then, as Nina says, if we talk about it, uh, you know, tell the story and help people see it and understand it, um, I, I think there is a real opportunity for us to change that. Um, but if, we're, if we just get in the tit for tat or if we're, you're not clear about how we communicate, uh, you know, we'll, 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 get, we'll get caught in the crossfire. So uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity. But to me, the most important thing is that we collectively keep working on things that actually improve sustainability in a real way that at least gives us the best chance to have things to talk about and maybe convince people to think a little differently, to open up their minds. You mentioned something that, that I think needs to be answered by, by everyone up here, and it was something that was submitted on Slido as well. Uh, you mentioned the, the not really wanting to get in an argument over what sustainability is, but I think the lack of a definition of what sustainability is has led to a lot of confusion in this marketplace. And so I'm wondering, how would each of the five of you individually define sustainability for the purpose of this conversation? I'll I'll, yeah, go ahead. In whatever order you'd like. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start since I threw it out there. So um, two things I think are important. One, I, I define sustainability as being able to, to do what we need to do to serve our needs today without uh, ruining our opportunity to do that for what we need in the future, right? Um, and the way to get there, in my view, is what I mentioned earlier around productivity. If we're constantly driving to produce more output better quality, better quantity, et cetera, per unit of input, whether it's land or carbon or water or nutrients, whatever it is, if we continue to improve that productivity, we're going to be reducing our footprint and we're going to produce and be producing things of value at a, at, a, at a better margin. So to me, that's sustainability and how to get there. I would add to that definition, accept it as it is, but there are... Um, much more profound changes that can qualitatively contribute to sustainability. One is simply genetically modified crops that are herbicide tolerant, combination of a fairly benign herbicide uh, and a crop means the soil stays on the, on the land. Okay, so the, the biggest contribution to no-till farming has been 
genet genetically modified crops. And piece by piece, um, innovations such as that are also a very fundamental part of sustainability. Um, go ahead. I, I think it's like defining beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. To We're some talking extent. about that next. Continue. <laughs> well, I think there's obviously the three pillars and there's that little nirvana of the intersection between the environment and economics and social values. And different people will weight those differently. If, if my main concern is, I don't know, cage-free chickens, I might not care that they're more expensive or that the environmental footprint is higher because my really one concern is that the chickens are out of their cages. And so my sustain I give 100% of my, my sustainability dollar to that one aspect of sustainability which throws the others two out. And I think everyone will have a different weighting depending upon who they are and that's part of the problem is there isn't defined metrics that you can use to say this is a more sustainable system than that. Um, and so that's, we, we have a situation of defining beauty, and I think it's always going to be in the eye of the beholder. So I was going to use the definition of pornography to <laughs> say the same thing, which is, uh, you know, I, we know it when we see it. And, uh, and, and so sustainability is that. I mean, it's context-driven. You know, sustainability today for me in this context may be different from, you know, if I'm someplace else tomorrow. And I think, you know, having a hard and fast rule of what sustainability is and that we're all going to stick to it and adhere to it and push it might in fact be, you know, uh, uh, create a, a negative uh, situation for us in the food and ag world. And, and going back to the, the three, I refer to it as the three P's, people, profits, and planet, and, and thinking of it from that perspective. And I think forcing a definition about sustainability really makes it tough because, again, it's context-driven and, and temporally driven, too. So, uh, uh, well, we can come up with ways to reduce our you know, footprint, produce better for a lot less of the inputs and things like that, and make sure that, uh, going back to Jim's comment as well, that over the long term we don't do the kind of damage on making decisions at this point in time. Yeah, I think very narrowly I see it as, as our ensuring that our planet can not only meet the demands that we're placing on it today, but the demands that we're going to place on it in the future. But I recognize that consumer perception is a big part of that because there's going to be a lot of things that we can do to put our planet basically in a position to feed a growing population. We just have to do it responsibly in a way that consumers will accept it. Mm -hmm. Now, despite all the variety of definitions, I could imagine a website coming from a reliable source, which I've previously mentioned, <laughs> that would show film clips of what, sustainable, what different aspects of sustainability could mean, drawn from USDA experience. Think about that. Another question that was submitted uh, on, on Slido was this, this concept of, is the idea of sustainable intensification really looking for more sustainable options in the, with your grocery dollar, with your restaurant dollar, what have you, is that at odds, perhaps, with the, with the local food movement and trying to produce and, and buy, buy foods that are produced a little bit more locally, which the USDA definition of local is pretty, pretty expansive in a lot of people's minds, but is that idea for pursuing a, a more sustainable diet at odds with the actual production that leads to that so-called sustainable diet? Um, I'll take a shot at it, and, and I personally hate sustainable intensification. It's a term that Gordon Conway and others came up with. The United Nations, you know, millennial uh, group, et cetera, they all picked it up and things like that. And, you know, sort of uh, squeezing, you know, more crop or drop and all these concepts that have come up as well. I think that's one, only one part of it in terms of that sustainability. The other aspect of it is sustainable consumption as well. This both things need to be going hand in hand. Uh, you know, going back to the amount of uh, calories we produce, about 2,500 per man, uh, calories per man, woman, and child. But in America, of course, we're number one in everything, and we consume uh, about 3,600 to 4,000 calories or something like that. And it really is, is the consumption aspect of it that drives all this as well. And so it's not just the fact that we're going to you know, somehow figure that all this out by doing sustainable intensification. It's got to be juxtaposed with the two bookends being consumption aspects as well, just behavioral changes. Again, Jim referred to that earlier as well. And reduction of waste. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but, uh, again, uh, using pictures can illustrate these complex uh, concepts in ways that people can grasp them much more easily. 
So that goes back to, to something I, I believe we talked about earlier and is something that it really seems to just always jump out for me when we're talking about sustainability, when we're talking about production. So, and this I think is a, a target that could be placed on both the consumer and the producer really here is are we going after real, genuine agricultural sustainability or the appearance of it? I, I, I think that some marketing groups capitalize on people's ignorance and are not going after real, genuine sustainability. Um, I think there's, and I'll throw a, a compliment out here to the Centre for Food Integrity and the uh, Responsible Egg Coalition, I think they were called, where they looked at the different components of sustainability and kind of rated different production systems and gave a very visual chart that showed the very real trade-offs associated with the various aspects of sustainability with different production systems. And every single one had it pros and cons. And so there, to me, the, 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 there is no one sustainable system. It'll, it depends. It's complicated. Um, and I think that trying to um, just, you know, market your system as the sustainable one and everybody else is, is bad is a real issue in the marketplace. And what concerns me the most as an ag scientist, if I improve the efficiency of beef cattle production in the US by 1%, I would be a rock star. I'd probably get, I don't know, some really amazing medal or something. But marketers, in one fell swoop, can basically halve production efficiencies by 50% by forbidding the use of certain safe innovation in systems. And so I feel a little bit like I'm in a war with the marketers. Um, I'm trying, and researchers are trying to improve efficiencies, and marketers are tr selling absence-labeled fairy tales um, that seem to the consumer like they're doing the right thing, but if you actually look at the data, they're voting with their consumer dollar against their own stated um, interests in the environment. And if you make consumers pick which of the three sustainability goals they, they most value, in almost every time I've done that with clickers, I get most of them saying the environment is their number one thing, and yet then they'll go and make purchasing decisions that absolutely contradict that stated, you know, shared value. And, and the only reason that I can understand that is because they don't, have not been told that that is actually what they're doing, and they've been lied to by these marketing groups who are saying that theirs is the sustainable system. Yeah, there's a great example of that in the in Oregon and, and Washington State, uh, pardon me, Washington State, Oregon, and, and California. The wineries out there, you know, they have this label of being sustainable, and they incorporate all aspects into it, uh, including that the labor itself is being paid a, a living wage, and you know, on and on. There's all manner of components that go into it, and it's it's all about marketing. It's you know, you get this almost like a USDA certified bona fide uh, sustainable. Uh, stamp of, of approval or whatever, and and that's it goes back to marketability and what marketers are uh, have done to the consumers in in the world and not just in America. Yeah, the only thing I was going to add is I don't have a problem with people who believe in fairy tales. I do have a problem oftentimes when people who believe in fairy tales enforce those fairy tales on others, and and I think that's one of the problems that we have in ag is that. We are very lucky as a society that we can choose to do things like have meatless Mondays and things like that, but we have a world out there that needs our product, and when you enforce a lot of these things in the United States that maybe you're choosing to do on production agriculture, you really impede our ability to do what we do well. And uh, Nina, it looks like you had something to, to chime in there as well. No, all I was going to say was that, that that misuse applies to the uh, USDA organic uh, <laughs> seal. <laughs> oh goodness! So I'll, I'll, I'll steer things back to the <laughs> I'll steer things back to the scientific end of the conversation here for a little bit. Another question that was submitted, wondering in, in terms of uh, again this intersection between uh, productivity and sustainability. Are there any big research gaps that we're looking at right here? Anything that could be tackled on a much bigger level than it currently is right now? Yeah. There's a there's a field that's emerging. I don't know if if it warrants major USDA funding for big research projects or not, but the, uh, yeah, the world, the consumers tend to just believe inherently that quantity and affordability, um, you can't have that and still have nutritious, delicious food. You know, they're, they're somehow mutually exclusive. And so one of the groups I'm working with is, is trying to turn that on its head, at least exploring the idea of can we do both. And, uh, and one of the things that they're working on is is cataloging vegetable proteins or, or vegetable um, 
crops around the world, and I don't mean carrots, I mean uh, you know, all sorts of vegetables, uh, to really understand the characteristics using modern tools of, of uh, biotechnology and molecular biology, et cetera, to, to, to do that in a, in, a, in a rapid scale. And we're finding some really interesting things. That, uh, that, that among bean protein that's been raised for four or 5,000 years, actually with some, um, some formulating capability, can produce a product that looks like, acts like, scrambles like scrambled eggs, just doesn't have any eggs. So whether that's going to turn the world on its ear in and of itself, probably not. But it does create some interesting ideas. You know, we, we tend to get things oriented around massive production of wheat, soybeans, corn. Um, you know, we tend to produce things the way we've been producing them and get better and better. That's not bad. That's good. But I wonder what would happen if we started to also think differently and kind of turn how, how we're creating food products on its ear. And would that create new opportunities for specialty legumes or uh, um, you name it uh, that might provide unique profit opportunities to some farmers, um, new food products that are healthy and nutritious, maybe more shelf stable, uh, et cetera. So uh, I think there's a whole arena there around understanding vegetable proteins and other vegetable uh, uh, plant-based characteristics from around the world, marrying that with what kind of food products you could create that would be nutritious, delicious, and still have the hurdle of affordability and, and be able to do it at scale and have that be uh, uh, added to the mix of options that consumers have. Not, not that we get in a war about which is better and which isn't, and oh my goodness, the egg board is gonna start fighting again. No, it, it, we're all in this together. There's plenty of room. We, need, we talked earlier about the uh, 10 billion people and the food we need to produce. How do we all work together to kind of create new opportunities? I think Jim's point's really well taken. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, what's happening, you know, everybody in, in the world, globally, humanity is super specialized in the diets that we consume. We all eat rice, we all eat wheat, we all eat potatoes, etc. And going back to what Allison was referring to as well, uh, these diseases in, for example, in uh, plantains. Uh, it's a you know, couple of diseases that are going to basically destroy everything that we know, not unlike the uh, Irish potato famine situation, right? And, and so we've become overly super specialized on just a handful of species that we consume, including animal species. And, and the diversification, I think that's what you're referring to in there, diversification of our crops and our animals that we consume and things like that. And that's where the, the action needs to be. A lot of the action needs to be, at least from our pers my perspective, is how do we go ahead and you know, improve what we're doing with the existing super specialized varieties of you know, uh, species of crops and animals and all that, but also bring in this greater level of diversification as well, particularly in light of you know, climate change and other things that could uh, wreak havoc and, and new uh, you know, uh, invasive species and new viruses and, and pathogens that are coming along that would that really do a number on our food systems. In terms of research needs, I think the big one, uh, I, I am very bullish on gene editing as long as we can manage the uh, consumer acceptance rollout. I think we are really at, at the forefront of a, a once in a lifetime uh, quantum leap, frankly, in productivity. I think one of the research needs that we really need to focus on is just look at PERS resistance in hogs. What are we going to do with all that extra pork coming from an exactly the same system size? And, uh, when we have additional product coming into market, it's going to have to find consumers, and I think we need to do the economic work to really understand how does that work in a global environment. Heck of a problem to have, isn't it? Well, I, I, producers want to stay profitable too. So, so it's one of those, uh, if these technologies go online in foreign markets that don't have the, the biosecurity controls that we have in the United States, and they all of a sudden have more pigs per litter tomorrow than they have today, how do we remain competitive in those markets that we depend on, you know, quite, quite frankly, right now? I, I, this will be a bit self-serving, geneticist, USDA funder. I think we need more funding in genetics. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but I do think that um, some of these new technologies are, are really very promising and do change what we are able to do. And if you look at the projections in terms of if we do go to the 9 billion, and we need basically a, a, a rate of improvement slope change. We need 
we're going along at this rate, we need a slope change. And those slope changes as it relates to breeding, which of course is a key component of sustainability, have almost always been associated with the introduction of a new breeding method, be it hybridisation or artificial insemination. Um, and so we need a, a slope changer. And to me, I think this potentially has the opportunity to, to not replace our traditional breeding programs. And that I sometimes get a bit annoyed with people overselling the technology. It will be a, a synergistic tool to help accelerate it. It won't replace our traditional breeding programs. But I do think there's a lot of opportunity to introduce useful genetic variation in a way that will make our breeding programs um, get to their breeding objectives at a faster I gotta rate. i got to put in a plug for funding, though. I mean, I, I think she <laughs> hit her spot on. Uh, seriously, I mean, when you look at the United States of America, the investments that we're making, public investments for public good, and we're falling further and further behind, and the uh, Ambassador Dowd referred to it as well, that we need these innovations. Those innovations ain't going to happen without the public investment for public good. And uh, uh, the Chinese and the Belgians and the Australians, they're all, you know, outstripping what the United States is doing. And if you look at the, uh, the numbers of patents coming along, the numbers of publications coming along, we're really fall, falling further. We've invented some of these things like gene editing and all that, but somebody else is really putting it to use. And that's what we should all be very concerned about. And that's for lack of funding, public funding. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, actually, I think that going back to first principles in the regulatory process would also unleash um, the, the um, academic sector. If academics could get some of their products those that are very similar to the kinds of changes that are, are possible to make by unregulated methods, such as chemical mutagenesis and uh, radiation mutagenesis, to farmers, which is what their traditional role was, I think you'd see a huge difference. But I'd like to introduce something that's even more radical, and that is um, the concept of producing useful meat products without the animals. So laboratory meats, that's an area that's coming along. It's very expensive. It needs more investment. But that would be the biggest, if, if, the, if the, that particular industry can make products that are acceptable to people and it tastes good, um, that would make a huge uh, discontinuous contribution to sustainability because it would require, that would take the animal part and of course, um, producing a, a, a kilogram of, um, um, of, of uh, hamburger takes 10 times as much grain as producing a, a kilogram of you or me. So decreasing the number of animals in the world eventually would, would make a huge difference in sustainability. Alison, you look like you have some thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I might have a little response to that one. Um, so I think this discussion is an interesting one um, because I think we need to look at the sustainability of, of in vitro meat as well. Um, but I also think it ignores the fact that animals are not just food. Um, they might be here, but in the developing world, they are also sources of fertilizer and they are uh, draft power, they're a banking system, they provide a billion um, smallholder farmers with a way of living and they're not going to be replaced by a petri dish of in vitro meat. So that might provide an alternative for the well-fed West, um, but I think it's important to acknowledge the role of animals in production systems and that they are not only food. Um, and I don't know if you want to... I also, ruminants, of course, are able to utilise land that's not usefully uh, productive in terms of producing food for humans and produce a high value protein on that land because of their four stomachs and their ability to digest roughages. So I think there's different discussions depending upon which animal we're talking about. And if you look at the biggest cattle population in the world, where would that be? India. <laughs> um, and so if you look at the US, it, the, if we're talking about ruminants, it's not a huge cattle population here. Um, they don't eat them in India. They don't eat what? They don't eat them in India. Yeah. Well, so, and, yeah, but... It's exported. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, Allison, you raised some good points, and I think, I, I don't know, Nina, what, how you would project the idea of cell-based meat, but one of the 
Just Incorporated is obviously one of the companies that's involved in this, so I, I've been paying more attention to it recently than, than before. And uh, personally, I don't expect that even with wild success of cell-based meat, that it's going to replace all animals. I, I doubt that's going to happen. Um, but, um, but I think it's more than just something that the West could afford. I think it'll certainly find a, a assuming we can get the affordability down. There's, there's a cost curve that has to be improved, but it's, it's happening, it's coming. Uh, but let's assume we can. Think about food security in developing countries. Um, or, or think about the Middle East. Uh, food security, not necessarily a developing country, but in the Middle East, where they don't have the opportunity to graze cattle, or you know, they can, they can raise hogs, et cetera, but it's very expensive. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to be able to actually produce some portion of the protein you want? Or if you go into areas that are really protein deficient, and maybe eventually they will be able to buy U.S. pork and beef. Hopefully they will. Hopefully the economies will grow. But could this be a means of getting more protein into the diet faster, you know, as long as it, it can be done safely, and done affordably, et cetera. So you know, we have to continue down the learning curve. But I, I think there are a lot of opportunities for cell-based meat um, for the world and what we're going to need for the 10 billion people that we should be careful not to get into the fight between and within the ag and food system, but instead think about how do we work together to, to ultimately feed the world in a sustainable way. So there's two aspects to food. One is it's a source of nutrients to us. And so we've got to all consume food, uh, nutrients I should say. It's coming, you know, it's a dense package of nutrients is what it is ultimately. That's one part of it. Yep. But there's a cultural aspect to it as well. Food has a very significant cultural component to it. And that cultural component is I want to sit at my dinner table with my family and friends. I want to eat a nice uh, you know, pork chop or uh, a T-bone steak or Kobe beef or you know, the wine terroir from California or Oregon or Burgundy or someplace like that. And there's a cultural component to it. And I think you know, there's a lot of interest in, in these sorts of you know, cell-based meat products and things. And again, we've provided funding for that too, by the way. And, and other aspects of things that are going on. But I think you know, uh, hum as long as humanity is around, Food has those two components to it, and we have to take into account both of those components, not just the fact that you know, Soylent, you know, this company that's got a lot of money, investors coming in, they're going to make a Slurpee and you suck it up. But that's not life. Life is about sitting with family and friends and enjoying uh, food as well. So I think we've got to take that into account as well. Uh, another conversation, it came in via Slido, and I think it's important for all of us to address, considering the fact that we have the, the perspective of, of the retail company, of the producer, of the government, of the scientist up here. I think with the benefit of hindsight, it's, it's near unanimous within the ag industry that GMOs were not properly communicated when they were first introduced into the, into the production system. So with that in mind, if gene editing is this next big thing, a tool in the toolbox, if gene editing is going to play a major role in American agricultural productivity in the next 10 to 20 years, how can we learn from the lessons that were taught to us rather than learned on, on GMOs when they were first introduced? How can we learn from those lessons to better communicate gene editing? I mean, I, I would say that the genetic companies in the first round did a great job of selling their products to agriculture. I think it's incumbent on them if they're going to put you at, speaking for a producer organization, from a producer organization, we need those companies that are bringing these technologies forward to actually engage consumers as well. Because in the end, we're going to be selling a product that incorporates their profit on, we need to make sure that there's demand for that. So I think these genetic companies really need to make sure that they're doing their part in talking directly to consumers. Ah. I'll take the, the sort of the contrarian view of that. I think the Monsantos, the DuPonts, and everybody else needs to stay out of it. They should produce it, but not get engaged in the conversations about these things. Going back to what Nina has been talking about, it is these credible, trustworthy folks. I mean, you know, as soon as you say the word Monsanto, et cetera, it's going to create this sort of an animus in the consumer's mind. And we don't want them to be driving the conversation, which you should really be, you know, consumers speaking about consumer issues and things like that, and then these credible, trustworthy sources as well. That's where it needs to start from. And again, you know, the funding that we've offered that uh, Nina has been a recipient of is one of those approaches to think of how do you bring about a conversation to take place without getting people ticked off that it's being, you know, something that's uh, being purveyed by Monsanto. So if Monsanto but, 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 needs to stay out of it, is there a role for any private sector 
group at all, or do you think this needs to be entirely consumer and producer driven? No, there's a role for the private sector in being supportive of these efforts, but really what people want is a sort of a third party validation or something like that. And the third party validation does not come from big corporate type entities. But you know, the commodity groups and others have a very significant role to play in this as well. I, I mean, I think that the traits or the characteristics uh, that come onto the market first are going to be important. And ideally, these would be traits that, that align with, with consumer values. Um, and certainly, um, we're working with Recombinetics on things like polled in, in dairy cattle as a, as a welfare trait. Um, the disease traits, I think, also people can understand they don't want animals getting sick. However, I am a little bit nervous that the groups that have profited out of the fear mongering around GMOs see this as a new cash cow, so to speak. Um, and I've seen already some standards coming out that have, um, you know, GMOs and gene editing kind of in their forbidden, uh, forbidden bucket. Um, and so there's uh, for sure going to working on a successful business strategy, there will be continued fear-mongering around this as the new GMOs. And, and so dealing with that fear is really difficult um, because it's much easier to scare people than it is to reassure them. And I think science has a hard time um, with that because all you can do is provide assurances and if you've just told someone they're going to get cancer if they eat it, you know, reassurances aren't enough. Um, and I think that um, ideally we could get out ahead, but I'm nervous that there remains that, that vested interest there in keeping up the fear and hype around it to help sell these um, other people's products. And so I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant and nervous about it, to be honest. Um, I think that we have to recognize that the well has already been poisoned, and which is a different way of saying what she just said. Uh, and strategies for changing what people believe, which is what it, it's, a, it's a part of the belief system, not rarely arrived at in a very reasoned way. Um, the efforts to change that belief system have to be have to recognize that that exists already and um, identify ways of building trust. And again, that's where I think USDA has an incredibly important role to, to play because it is a trusted organization. So actually providing information that can be used at all levels of society, including elementary schools, because very often kids are being taught by teachers more often now millennials, who are, have been convinced by the organic uh, food industry that GMOs are bad. So getting authoritative information down to the school levels will, will be important, and using also all of the contemporary means of communication that we have, um, particularly educational websites that are accessible to, to all levels of the population. You, you mentioned a number of times looking for a, a more involved role from the Department of Agriculture, but my question is, should the Department of Agriculture take that involved role? Does it run the risk of a perception of a bad actor as a simple shill of the agriculture industry if it does take on that, that expanded role that you're talking about, offering the unbiased information, does it run the risk amongst people that are already opposed to the technology, picking up their microphones and saying, the Department of Agriculture is just parroting information that's bad for you. I mean, does it run that risk? Yes, life is risky. And of course, the Department of Agriculture has already been sued, the FDA has been sued. The anti-groups are out there and, and they have their believers and they have their uh, funding bases, very often the organic food industry. Okay, so the, if the Department of Agriculture is to take a leading role, it will be accused of that but it has to rely on the basic, the science, and the science is quite clear, okay? Uh, that it will be accused and that it runs the risk of being accused and sued and all of that stuff. Those are real risks, but I don't know that there is any progress to be made if one doesn't use the reputation that one has to benefit the, uh, the majority of people and, and contribute to the welfare of of humanity, if you will. Mm -hmm. 
Jim, how, how can gene editing be communicated to consumers by perhaps companies that are using it, by the government, by the producers? How do you think, what, what kind of messaging do you think would be best received by a skeptical consumer when, in regards to gene editing? I think that a combination of all the things that have been said is going to be important. I don't think there's one simple answer. I mean, for, for example, if you just go up to a consumer and try to talk to him about gene editing, what's that? Th what's that? <laughs> that oh, you know, et cetera. So, so, you know, can we get traits or changes that are actually beneficial to consumers? So, what they hear is something that they that they uh, that they have value for, and and then does the curiosity take them to how did you do that? You know, or that's one thing. Um, People seem to be a lot more comfortable with things on the human health side. Is there a way to talk about, about this process uh, on the human health side? And it's also doing these great things in ag. I, I think it's going to take a, a, a combination of, of things rather than some big campaign that says gene editing is great for you. I, it, it just kind of creates a target, I think, that, that, that the antis uh, have a chance to yell louder. Yeah, pick up on that. Yeah, so, you know, it's kind of an interesting uh, um, situation that we've got with uh, people is that uh, people do not want us to muck around with the food that they're going to consume. You know, it's very personal, and, but they want the latest, greatest uh, technology in this. And interestingly, going back to what Jim just got done saying, uh, God forbid that they end up getting cancer or diabetes or whatever, even the food babe, for example, who is uh, anti-GMO, et cetera. God forbid that she gets, you know, these sorts of maladies. The, some of the new biologics that we see in, you know, potent anti-cancer and, and, you know, drugs that we've got, they're derived as GMO. -based. Even insulin that we use, you know, diabetics use is, in quotes, a GMO product. And so we've got that sort of an interesting uh, situation where if it's food, they don't want it to be mucked around with because they're going to be consuming it. And, but if it's something that's going to kill them, they need, you know, uh, whatever, anything, any, any tool that we can get. And so maybe there's some lessons learned about gene editing and other things that uh, there's a way to incorporate what happens in the world of uh, the medicine that could be incorporated into the world of food as well in conveying the messages and things like that. But, you know, Allison hit it on, on the head earlier about the kind of traits that you might want to start off with, you know. And, and those traits might very well be from an animal welfare perspective or maybe from a health perspective, you know, children going blind or whatever else that we've got, those sorts of uh, traits that might be worked on and then deployed and looking for the benefits that derive from it and then pursuing it further. As, as we approach the end of our conversation, I, I'd like to, to wrap up with uh, all, asking all of you to offer kind of a forecast of sorts. Um, there, it seems like we're on the cusp of quite a bit. There's a lot of good, really sound, productive innovations that are right around the corner. So in five or ten years, when all of us get back together again, hopefully we can avoid the blizzard this time, what, is the, what are we talking about? In five or ten years, when we have a similar conversation as this, what, what are we talking about? Are we still looking at overcoming regulatory burdens? Are we still talking about, man, this innovation is really close? In five or ten years, what's the conversation? I think unquestionably the technology is going to be unleashed internationally if we don't get a regulatory house in order domestically. So we're going to be having the conversation about the technology in the marketplace. The question will be whether or not we've had it here and whether or not we did, in fact, play the uh, consumer rollout properly. So uh, it's going to be deja vu all over again. Because five or ten years from now, there's going to be another set of people that's going to be talking about whatever those technologies are extant at that particular time. And they'll be saying, well, it's me, right? And uh, but that's, you know, that's human nature. You know, the technologies that are being developed, the knowledge that's being generated is constantly moving the conversation farther and farther. You know, 10 years ago, we had other conversations we're having, or 20 years ago, we did too. But what I see in the next five to 10 years is this incredible convergence that's taking place and already happening now, and it's all come to, together, is biotechnology, nanotechnology, information technology, and cognitive science and things like that all coming together. There's a guy named Ray Kurzweil. Some of you may have read his books. He's the futurist for uh, uh, Google. And uh, so he, he talks about this, this sense of singularity, you know, that is we're going to be able to transcend biological limits because of this convergence that that's taking place. I call it convergence to singularity. And I bet you in the next about uh, five to ten years we're going to get to that level of uh, singularity, convergence to singularity. And yet we're going to still be talking about the same sorts of things at that time too. 
If someone had told me that in 2018 I'd be sitting here and a fish that was produced more than a quarter of a century ago was still not available because it grows fast, do you guys grow pigs fast? <laughs> I, I would have said that they were crazy. So I, with that background, I'm a little bit pessimistic, I think. But I think the hope I see is a couple of things I have in my house, and I've noticed some in the audience here, millennials. Um, I think this next generation is very tech savvy, and I think that they are not going to um, go with the fear mongering that's, that's captured um, this technology. They will be used to um, this type of thing. And I, I, I put a lot of faith in you young people out there in the audience, because I do think um, that same way, artificial insemination was controversial when it was introduced. Refrigeration, vaccinations, well, maybe that's not a good example right now. <laughs> Going pasteurisation, well, maybe that's not a good example. I mean, you always have a pushback on innovation, and I, I just believe that this next generation um, is not going to have the same response to this that, that the last generation did. And my answer is it depends. I think it depends profoundly on what happens in the regulatory sphere and whether there's any uh, effort to introduce genetically modified more familiar foods, fruits and vegetables, to the largely urban populations, possibly through um, um, urban agriculture, which is, is coming to the fore in many, many cities around the world. Um, if genetically modified fruits and vegetables that are attractive to consumers can be introduced to them through, um, through, through uh, things like urban agriculture or uh, combinations of a, a green rooftop greenhouse and a cafe, someplace where you could actually experience that food and not have to read about it as an ingredient of uh, Wheaties or, or cornflakes, I think there's a chance that this conversation, these arguments can be put behind us. If that doesn't happen, we'll be here <laughs> again, because I've been at this for a depressingly long time. I'm sure some of the same issues will still be around in five or ten years, but I, I want to, uh, as I think about the future, I, I'll pick up on something that Sonny said, and that is that, you know, food is cultural. And I think that's absolutely true around the world. Um, something we need to think about, if, you, if we focus on the, on the U.S. for a minute, is the culture is changing. Um, it's changing other places, too, but it, the culture uh, and, and the expectations of food are changing. And so I think in five or ten years, we'll be talking a lot more about agriculture responding to and fulfilling what consumers are looking for. Today what we're feeling from consumers in production ag are the, uh, I'm going to say, some of the whims of the marketing people, whether it's the organic marketing people or some of the branded companies who jump on something because they have uh, 40,000 uh, posts on their Facebook page, so they think they have to go non-GMO just because of that. So it, I think eventually consumers are going to, they're going to continue to want to know where their food came from. They're going to want to know more about the story of their food. Hopefully they'll be a little more educated around what really makes a difference as opposed to just the whims. I, we'll see. Um, but I don't think that consumer desire to have a connection with how their food's produced and where it comes from is going to go away. So instead, I think we'll be talking more about how do we connect the dots along that as opposed to where we were for you know, a, decade, or a, a century of, of we produce this stuff, we produce it really well, let's produce it more efficiently, we produce more than we need, so let's export it. That's great, it's provided us um, affordable, safe food in the US. Wonderful success story. Going forward now, we're gonna have to say how do we also affordable, safe, nutritious and delicious food, and that's going to be by figuring out how to connect with food products that consumers really love and figuring out how to produce them in an effective way. And I hope that's the conversation we have in five or ten years. And in front of them. And in places where they can, can reach, because we are increasingly urban around yeah. the world. Exactly. Yep. I think that's a brilliant summary of what, uh, what, what Jim just got done saying. I think it's going to be demand-driven rather than supply-driven. That's what's going to drive this whole thing. Uh, the consumer wants something, and that's what's going to happen. People are going to step up to making that available. 
And if the consumer doesn't want it, it's not going to fly. So as you can all see, a number of things on the horizon, but as with any sort of uh, innovation worth having, it's a very long horizon. And it's a very uh, long conversation that, uh, that is out in front of us and a very worthwhile conversation that I think we all just had. So please join me in thanking our panelists.